Hello there. It's not Monday, it's Wednesday, but guess what? You are tuned in to Campaign Chat. My name is Michael Ross. I am the Democratic nominee for State House of Representatives, District 68 in Oklahoma. Thank you so much for taking some time to drop in and find out what's going on in the world of our campaign. A couple of quick notes for you. First of all, just a heads up that uh, this is the last campaign chat until after the June 30th, uh, the June 30th primary. Uh, so that's going to give you guys a little bit of time to focus on what will be on your ballot June 30th if you've not already sent in an absentee ballot. And let me remind you, it's not too late to request that absentee ballot. In the age of COVID-19, it's probably the safest thing to do. Remember that the southern part of our district, which includes Jinx, is among the area that has been hardest hit in the most recent spike in uh, COVID-19 diagnoses. We've shot up to, I think, uh, we have 100 cases or so in Jenks now, which is horrific. Uh, so take care of yourselves. Make smart, safe decisions. And one of those smart, safe decisions you can make is to request an absentee ballot. So I'm going to show you guys a quick explainer video. Take a look. If you haven't already cast your ballot, consider doing this to help keep yourself and your family safe. myself just dropped mine back in the mail at the start of the week. It was very fast, very easy, and I feel good about myself knowing that I'm not potentially making myself a vector to transmit to others on the 30th. So please consider taking that very easy step. If you would like, uh, if you'd like to to hit us up for any kind of uh, assistance, I know we've got a list of uh, some drive up notaries that are going to be available in the next few days. We'll get those posted for you. And make sure that you, like I said, make sure that you're being safe, that you're taking care of yourselves. Um, with that said, you know, keep in mind that with all of the, with all of the, the goings on discussing uh, this, this weekend's visit by the president, uh, I cannot stress to you enough how unsafe packing 20,000 people into the BOK Center is at this juncture. When you're telling us that the state is actually experiencing a upswing in, uh, in COVID diagnoses and they're talking about people coming in from not just out of town but out of state, it's, it's, a, potential, it's a potential catastrophe. I would remind you also that if, if Donald Trump is your candidate, I'm probably not the guy for you. I know that's a daring thing for me to say, it seems like, but, uh, you know, I, I think that the policies he's enacted have been egregious and his behavior has been unbecoming of a president. And uh, I, I think that it was not an accident scheduling a visit to Tulsa on the uh, on the anniversary of the ending of slavery, Juneteenth, and here as we approach the centennial of the Tulsa race massacre, which occurred in 1921. Um, I would also remind you that my opponent does not share those feelings. He does not share my reservations, uh, as we saw this last week. 
he was very eager to share information about the uh, about the visit from uh, Donald Trump, and in fact, he uh, he actually when when he was questioned very politely about it, this was his response. He said that he believes it was a Republican president that preserved the Union and emancipated the slaves. Would be nice if that was given consideration for his visit to bring our country together and honor black America. Can't think of a better place to do that than right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Let that sink in for just a minute. I'm not saying anything about my opponent's worldview or his, you know, what, what is in his heart, but I am saying this. By, by equivocating, by going in half measures, by not taking a stand against a man who has shown contempt for people of colors other than his, or people who are, you know, who have disabilities toward women. I think it it shows very poor judgment, and I would remind you that when you cast your ballot for state representative in November, that you're asking somebody to go to the go to the legislature and use good judgment and act in the best interest of all people in our district. And it's with that in mind that I'd like to take a moment to dig into something that actually, uh, it's a topic that, that has its roots in the history of institutional racism in the United States. And it's something that negatively impacts us today. It's a topic called redlining. Now, I put this out on social media last week. I said, how old were you when you first heard about redlining? Uh, what grade were you in? And the vast majority of respondents were not in grade school. In fact, many of them were well, said that they were well on their way to a degree. Um, in some instance, uh, instances, I had individuals who were working on professional certifications, people who were becoming realtors when they first heard about what this is. Um, in a couple instances, I had friends who had never heard about it. And the thing is that this was a policy that negatively impacted Black Americans, Black Oklahomans, Black Tulsans uh, when it was first instituted in the 30s and 40s. And it's had, it, it's almost like an infection that's never been treated. It continues to poison our communities today. So being a certified secondary schools teacher in Oklahoma history, U.S. history, economics, and civics, I love operational definitions. Let's lay out what is redlining. So what redlining is, is it's when financial services are denied to residents based on race. This was a policy that was instituted beginning, like I said, in the 30s and 40s during Franklin Roosevelt's administration. It's the ugly side of the New Deal, to put it very bluntly. What happened was uh, lenders were issued maps from the federal government that were color-coded to indicate what neighborhoods were considered viable for uh, safe investment in mortgages and development. And what you would do is you would say if something was in blue or green, those were those were prime locations. Those were places that you wanted to invest your money. Um, if a neighborhood was color coded in yellow, it was considered a risk, but not 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 completely out of bounds. Neighborhoods that were color coded in red, on the other hand, were considered high risk, and it wasn't by accident that those neighborhoods tended to be neighborhoods that were, at the time it was instituted, majority black. 
So these maps were issued, and you can actually go online and find them if, uh, if you want to take a look at the history of many notable communities in our country. Um, Tulsa is one of them. A map from 1940 is made, has been made available, and I went ahead and pulled that map and zoomed in on the area that is in our district. The map actually kind of cuts off at about 51st Street because back in 1940, Tulsa had not developed moving to the south. Um, Jenks and Glencool, those were primarily still very rural. In fact, uh, Jenks doesn't see a major population boom until you get later into the 20th century. So let's take a look. Here's West Tulsa, 1940. And you'll notice that the colors have kind of faded. So we went ahead and uh, intensified that red so that you can see that this is West Tulsa, north of 51st Street. And it's the areas around Webster High School. It's the areas around, uh, if you go up, you can even see the, the oil fields that now are, uh, that are still there. You see uh, the area around where uh, OSU Tulsa is, the OSU Medical Center. It's most of the north half of our district that had been developed. The lasting impacts include lower home ownership. In fact, we're going to take a look at some stats here in a second from, uh, from two precincts in our district. But you had lower home ownership. You had lenders that used predatory lending rates. In fact, uh, this is actually still an area that's heavily impacted by uh, payday lenders. Uh, you also had limited wealth growth and still have limited wealth growth. Because the fact of the matter is that by denying people the ability to build up home ownership equity, you were denying them, in many cases, opportunities to build up credit and opportunities to have that real estate investment that makes, makes the American dream possible for so many people. So, like I said, we're going to take a look at two of our precincts, and we're going to start with Precinct 139. Now, Precinct 139 is the northernmost section of House District 68. It's up there at the curve in the river. Um, it's the area. Uh, it's the area that faces uh, uh, faces OSU Medical. Um, you know, it's. The area where if you live there, you vote at La Fortune Towers. It's going to include parts of River West. Elliott Field School is going to be in this precinct. And if you look at data from the last couple of years from the Census Bureau, you find that Precinct 139 is a majority rental precinct. 91.6% of people who live in this precinct are renters. Only 8.4% are actually owners of the home they live in. Keep in mind also that when we talk about rental, we have very landlord-friendly laws in the state of Oklahoma, and we have a number of landlords in our district that are not local, that are not members of our community, that in many cases are out of state. You also see that the majority of households in this precinct are bringing, are bringing in under $24,000 a year. $24,600 is the poverty line for a family of four. Let that sink in for a moment. Now, this is West Tulsa. This is, this is Precinct 139. This is a section that we saw in that red lines map. Let's take a look at a precinct that was not heavily impacted by redlining. Keep in mind, redlining was outlawed in 1968. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, who had actually been a school teacher serving uh, low-income families in West Texas uh, before becoming a uh, politician, saw firsthand the effects of uh, generational poverty and the, the impact of programs like redlining on, on families. Um, so in 68, you had what was called the War on Poverty. 
And one of the laws that was passed was one that repealed redlining. And further down the line in 77, you had another law that was passed under the Carter administration that was meant to encourage much more investment in communities. So there were steps taken at the federal level to, at the very least, I'm not going to say cure the ills of redlining, to triage, I guess at best. So we're going to move further south and we're going to go down to Precinct 703. This is a Jenks precinct. Um, like I said, Jenks really doesn't see a major population boom until you get to really about the 1980s or so. So this was not a community that was as heavily impacted by those uh, redlining maps from the 30s and 40s. So in Precinct 703, you see that it's almost the inverse of 139. 86.2% of homes that exist in Precinct 703. And this is going to be over by Jenks West Elementary and Jenks West Intermediate. 86% um, of, ho of homes are owned by the resident. 13.8% um, are rental. And you see a substantial boost in the, uh, the household incomes. You're looking at the majority of households bringing in over $100,000 total a year. And when you look at the quality of life that that affords people, it's night and day. The differences are so stark and so powerful. And you have to ask the question, what can we do to put folks on a level playing field? So, just to kind of drive this home once more, let's take a look at, this is the income breakdown for these two precincts. Here's 703 again. You can see that there, there is a massive spike at the $100,000 to $149,000 annual level. But then take a look at Precinct 139. And you see that same spike is way, way down at the under $10,000 range. The contrast is, the contrast is a powerful one. What can be done about this? Well, there are some steps that can be taken, like I said, to at, at the very least put people on a path toward a more level playing field. I am an advocate for things like uh, for things like raising the minimum wage. We can't expect people to support themselves on seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. It the math does not work. It doesn't. And we're talking about a minimum wage that hasn't been adjusted since 2009. And when you take everything into account for inflation, the minimum wage is, has, it, has less buying power than it has had at any point since 1968, that very year that redlining ended. That was the last time that the minimum wage was as weak as it is now. When you have precincts in our district where people are struggling to get by at that level, it's on us to say what's the right thing to do here. And unfortunately, we can't ask the city of Tulsa to do that because the state, <clears throat> excuse me, the state handcuffed municipalities a couple of years ago by passing a law that says that cities and towns can't set their own minimum wage. Tulsa can't raise its own minimum wage even if it wanted to. It has to be done at the state level. So keep these things in mind. Keep that in mind. Keep in mind that we need to take a hard look at the laws regarding landlords and tenants in the state of Oklahoma. Like I said, it's skewed toward landlords right now. It's important to recognize tenant rights so that hopefully we can help people build a better quality of life. 
Um, as I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, the city of Tulsa has one of the highest eviction uh, rates in the nation. I believe we're 10th in eviction. And one of the ways that we can help pull that number back down is by empowering residents. We also need to look into things like uh, the way in which the minimum wage is applied toward disabled people. So that you know, um, disabled folks tend to be, uh, was it one in four disabled Oklahomans uh, is living on minimum wage or less. And there are actually laws in place that allow some institutions to pay less than the than minimum wage to disabled workers. We need to take a hard look at that and say, what are we doing to, what are we doing to make things equitable? What are we doing to make things right? Keep all of this in mind as we move forward. Please ask hard questions of me. Please ask hard questions of Lonnie Sims. He's supposed to be trying to earn your vote. And if he won't engage on these topics, I will. So with all of that said, I hope this has been informative. I hope this is the beginning of a conversation. And I hope it gets you thinking about ways in which we as a community can work to lift our neighbors up. There's that, that wonderful old saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, you know, that's true, but at the same time, a boat's only gonna rise so much if it's got holes punched in the hull. So with that said, a uh, couple of quick reminders. One, remember that June 30th is uh, primary day. I do not have a primary. Um, I am the general election candidate, uh, but there are others who have primaries. There's a uh, OK1 uh, house race. There's, uh, there's a very competitive Senate race. There's, uh, there's a lot more than you realize on the ballot, um, both for Republicans and Democrats. And once again, State question 802, please place your mark in the yes column on that. Uh, we'll be back with, campaign, with more campaign chat in July. Like I said, we're gonna take a couple weeks off uh, to get some stuff done. Uh, remember that this campaign is entirely people powered and your contributions are what makes it possible. I actually was updating our records today and when I saw the list of names, not corporations, people uh, who had contributed what they could. I've had contributions come in at the $5 level. I've had contributions come in at the $50 level. Um, I'm deeply touched and honored. And know that if you're investing in this campaign, you're investing in us. You're investing in not a person, but you're investing in a a moment for change in our district and hopefully in our state. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful couple weeks. I will be active on social media, of course, and we may be dropping a couple other videos as we go. But again, tune in in a couple weeks. Uh, we'll make some announcements about when Campaign Chat is returning. And in the meantime, be, will, be well, stay safe. Uh, Take precautions, uh, wear your masks, wear your PPEs, wash your hands, practice social distancing, and uh, be safe out there. And we'll be in touch. Have a wonderful evening.